He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora, ko William Ray Aho, no mai ki te hipipango. Welcome to Black Sheep. This podcast discusses mental health issues, drug abuse and suicide. Please listen with care. This is the second in our two-part episode on Eric Mario, the orchestra conductor who was twice convicted of murdering his wife, actor and singer Thelma Mario. Before we go on, let's recap. On April 15th, 1935, a doctor was called to the bedside of 29-year-old actress Thelma Mario. Oh, it looks like veronal poisoning. Within a matter of hours, Thelma was dead, and suspicion fell on her husband, the flamboyant 45-year-old orchestra conductor, Eric Mario. Is there anything in this to hang me? Uh, I feel like going and hanging myself, bringing all this veronal into the house. The Crown alleged that Eric Mario poisoned his wife in order to replace her with his assistant, Eleanor Brownlee. Was it not that his own wife was now an encumbrance? His wife was nothing to him, sexually or financially. A key witness in the case was Thelma's close friend, Frieda Stark. But Eric told the police Frieda and Thelma were more than just friends. Between us, my wife is fonder of women than of men. You know what I mean? Frida denied this at the time, but decades later she confirmed the two had been lovers. I used to sleep with Thelma to keep her company, <laughs> but he was playing the orchestra. At trial, the prosecution called three medical experts who argued that while Thelma may have taken a dose of Veronal voluntarily on the Friday night, she must have also had a second dose on the Saturday. As the experts explained, it was medically impossible for Thelma to relapse into a coma on Saturday night unless she'd taken that second dose. The Crown said the second dose was put in a glass of milk, which Eric prepared for Thelma. There definitely was a glass of milk. Whether or not Buranel was in it is a, is a different matter. Then there was the circumstantial evidence. Eric repeatedly refused to call a doctor. He also acted suspiciously when first approached by the police. The jury must have found all this stuff pretty compelling. After all, Eric Mario was twice convicted of murder. But the judge in Eric's second trial was much less certain. He was sure that the jury had got it wrong. So why was this judge so uneasy about Eric Mario's conviction? What did he see that the jury didn't? First, let's look at that circumstantial evidence. Frieda Stark said she repeatedly urged Eric Mario to call a doctor for Thelma, first on the Saturday. Mario said that a few hours sleep wouldn't hurt her and it wouldn't hurt her to sleep until morning. Then on Sunday morning... I said, don't you think we'd better get a doctor? Thelma has been asleep practically two days. And yet again on Sunday afternoon. I said, Thelma isn't awake yet, and I'd think you'd better get a doctor straight away. He replied, oh, it's all right, I rang up the chemist. And he said the sleep was due to nervous exhaustion. Thelma could sleep for two or three days without any ill effect. Then, finally, on Monday morning. By this point, Thelma was blue in the face, gasping for breath. I said to Mario, oh, why didn't you get a doctor? And with that, I ran out to ring the doctor from Mrs Knight's next door. Now, I'd like you to put yourself in Eric's shoes for half a second. Imagine this was your partner, or even just a good friend. How long would they have to be unconscious before you called a doctor? I'm betting it wouldn't be three days. But here's the thing. Eric Mario may not have seen this as anything unusual. As he later explained to the police, I was used to seeing my wife in an unconscious condition through alcohol. She drank on average two bottles of sherry every day. So maybe Eric didn't call the doctor because he assumed Thelma was just sleeping off another bender. Eric's children, Graham and Betty, said they'd often seen Thelma drunk. Betty said Thelma occasionally drank so much that she stayed in bed for days or even weeks at a time. This was supported by Thelma's GP, who testified that she had symptoms consistent with alcoholism. The last time he saw her, she'd been vomiting every morning and was in a state of what he too described as nervous exhaustion. 
Dr Charles Farrell is a co-author of The Trials of Eric Mario and one of our guests for this episode. I mean, nowadays we would say mental health issues. There's no doubt about that. Pretty fragile anyway, psychologically. Clearly, Thelma was suffering from alcohol addiction, but she also seems to have suffered some kind of paranoia or anxiety. She was terrified of getting an operation. She constantly told people that she was afraid she had appendicitis. She was also incredibly scared of getting pregnant. And this fear of pregnancy might be another reason Eric Mario was reluctant to call a doctor. He might have been worried that the cause of her illness wasn't Veronal, but another illegal drug. A drug he gave her three days before she died. Frida Stark said Eric mentioned this drug to her when she visited the house that Friday night. I had a conversation with Mario. He told me that Thelma thought she was pregnant, that he had bought some medicine for her just to show her that he was looking after her. When he was talking of her, thinking she was pregnant, he said, she is silly, she is only four days overdue. Mario presumably thought it's not possible that she's pregnant. I mean, okay, she's having an affair with Frida Stark. That doesn't mean that they may not have slept together as well. That's, but you know, as far as we can tell, they probably didn't. So she can't have got pregnant, but she's in such a crazy way that she thinks that she might be. By the way, Eric was right. Thelma's post-mortem later proved she wasn't pregnant. But to keep his wife happy, he went to the chemist, asking for something to set her mind at ease. This would have been the case for any man at that time. And doesn't say, hey, my wife thinks she's pregnant, can I have an abortifacient, please? Yeah. (laughs) Because at that time they were illegal, the chemist would have been in serious problems for selling something like that. So there would have been this circuitous sort of conversation going on. And this circuitous conversation could have been misinterpreted. It seems likely Eric Mario didn't want an actual abortifacient. That's a drug to induce a miscarriage. After all, he didn't think Thelma was pregnant. But the chemist may have thought Eric was just being evasive because the drug was illegal and gave him the real thing anyway. So Eric walked away from the chemist with a box of pills and he had no idea what was in them. Whether the drug was real or a placebo isn't really important. What's important is that Eric Mario thought this drug was causing Thelma's illness, not Veronal. One of the doctors at the hospital said Eric explained this theory to them when he arrived with Thelma on Monday afternoon. The doctor said Mario told him that... Thelma, his wife, had a horror of pregnancy, that she had obtained some medicine from a chemist and he had thought her condition was due to the taking of this medicine. He made it quite clear who had obtained the medicine from the chemist that she had. This was a lie. Thelma didn't buy those abortion drugs or whatever they were. Eric did. He only came clean once the lie was exposed by both Frieda Stark and the chemist. But it could explain why Eric acted so suspiciously during Thelma's illness and after she died. He says these vague things to a chemist and then he worries that maybe he was given a dangerous illegal drug that would get him into trouble um, as well as the chemist. But that still leaves a big unanswered question. The abortion drug wasn't the cause of Thelma's death. She was killed by virinal poisoning. So how did Thelma overdose on Veronal? Well, let's go through the timeline laid out by the prosecution. First, Thelma takes a dose of Veronal on Friday night. This dose was taken voluntarily to help her sleep. Then on Saturday morning, Eric's 17-year-old son, Graham, hears a bump in the bedroom. He goes in to find Thelma swaying and mumbling incoherently. Graham and Eric put her back to bed and leave her alone for a couple of hours. Finally, Eric and Frida wake Thelma up that night using smelling salts. Eric gives her a glass of warm milk, supposedly laced with a fatal dose of Veronal. But what if there was no Veronal in that glass of milk? What if instead Thelma took a dose of Veronal 
on the Saturday morning. Here's how Eric Mario's lawyer, Humphrey O'Leary, put it. On Saturday morning, she was out of bed, obviously searching for something. And either then, or in the two hours when she was alone, between about 11.30am and 1pm, she got Veronal and swallowed it. And that was the Veronal from which she died. So the three medical experts for the prosecution all agreed it was possible Thelma took a dose of Veronal on the Saturday morning, but they still thought there must have been another dose that night. Again, they argued it was medically impossible for her to take a dose of Veronal on Saturday morning, regain consciousness that night, then relapse into a coma and die without being given an extra dose. But according to the defence, there was another explanation. Throughout the Saturday, Thelma had no food or drink, and her digestion was practically at a standstill, and the Veronal would take hours to dissolve. But then, that Saturday night, Eric and Frida woke Thelma up using the smelling salts and gave her milk and bread. Which would greatly hasten the solution of the Veronal remaining in the stomach. So according to the defence, there was no Veronal in the milk. Instead, the milk, bread and smelling salts sped up the absorption of Veronal, which was already in Thelma's stomach. Then, in spite of the efforts of Miss Stark to keep her awake, she lapsed into unconsciousness and died. Death was due to the Veronal taken on the Saturday morning, and it was not necessary for her to have taken it on Saturday night. But why would Thelma take Veronal on the Saturday morning? I mean, it's a sleeping drug. Why would you take it as soon as you woke up? Well, on the second day of Eric Mario's first trial, his lawyer got a telegram from a man called Alex Whittington in Australia. If called, could give material evidence support defence Mario case. The lawyer cabled back. What is nature of evidence? Whittington responded have frequently seen deceased before marriage depressed taking Veronal. This evidence came too late for Eric Mario's first trial, but it was a big part of why he got a second trial for his appeal. Alex Whittington was interviewed by police in Australia and his testimony was read at the second trial. That trial also heard testimony from a woman called Irene Riano, who said that before she was married, Thelma was... Addicted to headache powders and sleeping potions. Irene Riano's daughter and granddaughter were both actresses. They were the ones who first took Thelma from Australia to New Zealand. Thelma so convinced them that she would do away with herself unless they took her, that they decided to take her over to New Zealand. Adding to this, there were several other witnesses who knew the Marios in Auckland. Many described Thelma's fear of operations and childbirth. Some also mentioned her drinking heavily and taking drugs. Herbert Kingsland, who worked alongside Eric Mario at the St James Theatre, said Thelma would frequently take abnormal numbers of pills out of a bottle, practically emptying the bottle. She was frequently sick for two or three days at a time and said on several occasions that she would sooner commit suicide than have an operation or a child. When Thelma Mario's GP took the stand, Eric's lawyer asked him about his patient's state of mind. You would have been surprised if you had heard she had committed suicide? No, I wouldn't. So now we have multiple witnesses who say not only was Thelma addicted to Veronal, she was also depressed and potentially suicidal. Maybe Thelma woke up that Saturday morning, still convinced she was pregnant, and decided to kill herself using Veronal. Alternatively, the overdose could have been accidental. One of the big reasons Veronal and other barbiturates are no longer used as sleeping medication is a side effect called automatism. With automatism, people sort of forget they're under the influence of a drug and try to take more of it. There's actually a theory that Marilyn Monroe's death was a case of barbiturate automatism. (laughs) 
By this point, we've thrown a lot of doubt on the Crown's case against Eric Mario. And just to be clear, we're not saying Eric was definitely innocent. It's possible he did kill his wife exactly the way the prosecution said. But did they prove their case beyond reasonable doubt? I don't think so. And neither do either of my guests for today's episode, Justice Rebecca Ellis and Dr Charles Farrell. He was worried about that people would think it was him. That that does seem to be clear. But I don't think that means it was him. He had a uh, bad he, he must have had a bad conscience about so many things. Mm. But killing his wife was not one of them. So given all these doubts, how is it that two separate juries convicted Eric Mario of murder? Well, now we're getting into some very murky water. Jury deliberations are secret. We don't know what they made of the evidence put before them. But one thing that seems likely is that they held some kind of prejudice against Eric Mario. I mean, for one thing, Eric's habit of walking up and down Queen Street in a coat and tails can hardly have endeared him to New Zealanders in the middle of the Great Depression. Remember, both these trials are happening in 1936. Justice Rebecca Ellis. I mean, people were not well off, and I suspect there was a distrust of people who seemed obviously foreign, which he did. I mean, his name, I mean, that was the point of his name. I think he wanted to sound like he was Italian. He, he He wanted to be foreign, he wanted to be exotic. But hang on, you might be thinking. Sure, Kiwis might have been prejudiced against Eric, but surely they would have been even more prejudiced against his victim, Thelma Mario, and against the Crown's key witness, Frida Stark. After all, these two women were accused by Eric Mario of being homosexual. In the 1930s, that was an incredibly serious charge. In fact, five years after the trial, the Crown's key medical witness, Sir William Wilcox, completely changed his opinion on the case and said Thelma had probably taken the veronal herself. Why? Well, partly because he found out Thelma was a lesbian. This condition is commonly associated with addiction to drugs, like like veronal, and to alcoholic excess. So why didn't this kind of prejudice affect the jury? Well, a big part of the prosecution's case was that Eric Mario was lying about his wife's relationship with Frieda Stark. Now to me, and probably to you, this seems astonishing. Because Thelma Mario was clearly lesbian or bisexual. Frieda Stark said in court that she frequently spent the night in Thelma's bed. Thelma had received letters from a woman in Sydney describing herself as Thelma's lover. In fact, Part of that letter includes a part where the writer says that she, and I quote, practised the gentle art of lesbos in a modern setting. I mean, how much more obvious can you get? But Dr Charles Ferrell says that while it might seem obvious to us that Thelma Mario was lesbian or bisexual, it wasn't as obvious to Kiwis in the 1930s. In those days, even professional psychologists and so-called sexologists had all kinds of strange ideas about homosexuality. At this point in in the UK, there's the famous Radcliffe Hall trials. She wrote um, a a novel called The Well Well of Loneliness, Loneliness, which is... And she was a lesbian herself in a long-term relationship with another woman, and the novel was partly about that, and it was created a furor. But Marguerite Radcliffe Hall didn't actually use the word lesbian. She described herself as gender inverted. She dressed in men's suits, cut her hair short, and sometimes went by the name John. If Radcliffe Hall was born today, she might have identified as trans or non-binary rather than a cisgender lesbian. But for the experts at the time, when they thought of homosexuality, they thought of people like Radcliffe Hall theories about homosexuality, male and female, floating around in which if you were one or the other, you were an invert, which meant that you, if you were male, you behaved like a woman and vice versa for women. Thelma Mario and Frieda Stark did not fit this 1930s theory of gender inversion. Both were conventionally attractive, apparently seeming heterosexual women. So, in the eyes of the so-called experts, 
Thelma and Frida couldn't possibly be lesbians. The crucial thing is, is that the public didn't believe this. But even before the trial began, the line on Mario was that he was blackening his wife's name and, and also blackening the name of his, his wife's best friend. I should say, the question of whether the jury believed Thelma and Frida were lesbians is something Dr Farrell and Justice Ellis disagree about. Do you not recall we got an email from one of the jurors or one of the, might have been a child or one of the jurors who said, of course we believed it. We totally accepted that they were lesbian, which kind of does undermine one of our theories. I don't believe it. <laughs> anyway, because <laughs> we not you, 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 so you, you heard from one of the jurors. I think it was a, a child, uh, well, a grown-up child of one of the jurors who said, yeah, my father was on the jury, and of course, yeah, they, all, they all totally accepted that that was what was going on. So, I mean, I, I don't believe that. I mean, that that can't possibly be true. You don't convict a guy at that time on the evidence of a a lesbian who's having a relationship with the woman. I think you're doing New Zealand as a disservice. I'm quite enjoying enjoying this conflict between my interviewees. (laughs) I certainly think that there was a lot of feeling against Mario, but I don't think it was because he was viewed as blackening his wife's name. I think it was much to do, much more to do with what we were talking about before of him just being But the blackening different. his wife's name is just repeated over and I know, that over was the crown, and over. That was the Crown in, case, yes. In, in, yes. Yes, but by um, newspapers as well, by the tabloids, it was repeated over and over and over. It's really what the jury believed. I, I guess that's what we were talking about. Which we won't know. No. <sighs> well, except the one of, us, one of them wrote to us. <laughs> Don't believe, don't believe her. <laughs> Setting aside for a second what the jury believed, it's definitely true the newspapers thought Eric Mario was lying when he called his wife a lesbian. And speaking of newspapers, they are almost as big a character in this trial as anyone else, especially the New Zealand Truth, the most notorious tabloid in the history of Aotearoa. All through the Mario trials and long afterwards, the truth was running the most incredibly one-sided articles, painting Eric Mario as the most diabolical villain you can imagine. They actually used the word diabolical, by the way. It was one of their favourite adjectives for this case. The poisoner works with calculated cunning, doing his victim to death in the most cold-blooded manner exerting every while to assure that his crime goes undetected. Diabolical cruelty is the essence of the nature of the person who slays by poison. It was in full, full nauseating tabloid mode, not just during the trials but afterwards because there was a long aftermath as well. And, you know, to read it, I suppose, now I just, I just thought this is as bad as... What, what we get now on, on the internet or on Fox News or something like that. It is pretty astonishing, you know, like the flimsiest little thing, like the way his facial expressions during the trial are sort of interpreted to be sort of smoking gun evidence of his <laughs> guilt. It's, it's, you almost feel like the, the sort of politicians and, the, and maybe even the, the jury got the feeling they'd be going very much against public opinion. To, to well, well, that is the other thing, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember if we mentioned this in the book, but of course now we say to juries, you must not read the newspapers uh, while you are on the jury. Uh, if you do see anything about the trial, you must disregard it. But I don't know whether juries were told that uh, then, and it would have been pretty hard to avoid uh, <laughs> if, if they were. So we have to imagine the jury is reading articles in truth which paint Eric Mario in the most horrific terms possible. And you've got to imagine they might have been influenced by that coverage. I cannot see how they could not have been. Mm. I mean, there's a photo, I think, in the book of them walking into court, isn't there? I mean, that's the other thing. There's absolutely no way you'd be allowed to take a photo of the jury now. So not only are the jury reading all this horrible stuff about Eric Mario, so is the wider public. And the wider public knows who's on the jury. Any juror who decided Eric might be innocent was taking a bit of a social risk by saying so. What's more, they had to contend with a very compelling prosecution witness. Frida Stark painted a grim picture of Eric Mario, an alcoholic, abusive womaniser who killed her best friend, Justice Rebecca Ellis. Her distress was completely uh, 
genuine. Thelma and she were, were extremely close. And to the extent you buy into the idea that she lied, deliberately lied, as opposed to perhaps just misspoke or misremembered, she, I suppose, had a motive for doing that. So was Frieda Stark a liar? Lies are so difficult, aren't they? Because I often think that even if people are lying, half the time they it's a sort of sociopathic thing. They, they don't necessarily think that they are. And, I mean, that may well have been the case with her. Most of Frieda's supposed lies or misrememberings are small things. For example, when it came to how much milk Thelma drank on the Saturday night, Frieda said... She drank not quite half a cup. But Graham, Eric's 17-year-old son, said Thelma only drank a couple of spoonfuls of the milk. It's a small detail, but it's critical to the case. A couple of spoonfuls of milk couldn't possibly contain enough virinal to kill. Half a cup could. There's also Frieda's testimony about Thelma and Eric's relationship. Frieda describes Eric as angry and occasionally violent. Others painted the relationship as strained, but mostly friendly. Again, it's fine lines, question of emphasis. Frieda could easily be the one remembering these situations accurately. There were no sort of big lies that she told, right? They were all matters of emphasis. Well, I mean, one of the things that she sort of seems to suggest quite heavily is that Thelma almost never drank. Um, oh, right, is, right. Yeah, well, that's, is, that's you're right there. That's certainly a lie, yeah. The evidence that Thelma Mario was an alcoholic is overwhelming. And yet Frida said she never saw her drunk. I mean, maybe Thelma was really good at hiding it, but... It's hard to see this as anything other than a lie. There are also big questions over Frieda's allegation that she repeatedly urged Eric to call a doctor. Years later, the Attorney General, Rex Mason, who later became a lifelong supporter of Eric Mario, wrote this about her evidence. Of the two, she was much the more averse to getting a doctor. She alone caused the final and fatal delay of the last 24 hours. While Mario was sleeping on Sunday afternoon, she observed in the patient a new and terrible symptom of the sort, which the next day heralded imminent death. She concealed this from Mario. The symptom he's talking about there is that Thelma was gasping and gurgling and couldn't be woken up. I want to stop short of calling Frieda Stark an out-and-out liar. Personally, I think it's more likely she believed she was telling the truth. But she was under serious emotional pressure. Not only was she grieving the loss of her lover, Eric Mario was trying to publicly out her as a lesbian. That was an extremely big deal in the 1930s. Plus, during the trial she was getting regular letters from Thelma's mother in Australia. My dear Miss Stark, you can rest assured we will ever remember you for defending our beloved daughter. If all the world came and told me my little daughter Thelma was a drunkard, I would tell them to go and lie no more. Thelma was the essence of refinement. He was not even fit for her to wipe her shoes on. Oh, it makes me ill to think of it. A girl brought up, educated like Thelma was, to live under the same roof with such a criminal. The mother was was sending her basically revenge letters, saying, you know, make sure this bastard goes to jail or gets hanged. You know, she's telling the main witness for the prosecution, you know, um, go for it, basically. For some reason, these letters weren't seen as a big deal by either of the judges in either of the two trials, which, honestly, I find kind of astonishing. Um, If it happened today, it would be clear grounds for a mistrial. Pressuring a witness like this can easily affect their testimony. Because you feel something emotionally, because she feels that she felt that a wrong had been done, which in a sense it had, Um, because as we said before, if Mario had called the ambulance earlier, Thelma might have been all right. Um, it's a small step from that to, to actually a slightly 
a, a slight lie, I suppose. I, I, look, I don't, I don't know. I don't or, or maybe like a small suspicion gets, a suspicion, yes, that's gets right. turned into something that she definitely thinks happened and saw yeah. happen. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Then there's all the other stuff which might have helped swing the case against Eric Mario. For example, the judge's summing up of the case in both trials was extremely problematic. They're both extremely confused and poorly written. Um, <laughs> well, I think they did them. In, they did. We, we do them differently now. Yeah, I know. I we know. It was like a, we write them in advance. I mean, what I th- I, I'm pretty sure what would happen then is is the case finishes and the, and the judge goes straight into the summing up. So it's extemporised. I mean, it's just it's just coming out as it comes out. Yeah, and, and that's how it sounds. And it's very confused and um, illogical at points and so forth. And then there's the evidence of the pathologist, which was accurate, but probably a lot more detailed than it needed to be. Um, Dr. Farrell read an extract when we were doing our interview, and if you're squeamish, maybe block your ears for the next 30 seconds. The liver, spleen and kidneys were in one jar and the others in separate jars. Um, He was given two pounds of brain. I first put it through the mincer machine, the whole two pounds. It is probably a superior type of household mincer. It is thoroughly minced up and goes through a mesh of one sixteenth of an inch. It is then mixed, which is done with a spoon in a jar thoroughly. Yes, it certainly, there's, there's something prejudicial about that, I think, and it's not something we would do. No. We would do today. Oh, no, the poor, the poor jury. If you look at all this stuff together, you can understand why two separate juries convicted Eric Mario of murder, even when the evidence was so shaky. Meanwhile, the New Zealand truth seemed to be almost rubbing its hands with glee waiting for Eric Mario's hanging. It was particularly excited to report that a woman had apparently applied to act as the executioner. Truth now reveals how numbers of people have hastened to apply for the grisly task of hanging the musician. Among them, a member of the sex whose affections Mario so easily accepted and spurned. Blind adoration of the majority has been transformed into the merciless, calculating estimate of the condemned man's worth by individuals of the sex. But, as we said right at the beginning, the judge in Eric Mario's second trial, Justice Callan, was deeply uneasy with the verdict. He was sure that the jury had got it wrong and wrote to the Attorney-General saying as much, which I have never heard of ever happening in any other case. It probably goes without saying that judges don't normally write to the government saying a jury made the wrong call. It kind of undermines the whole point of an independent jury. This letter went over all the same ground we've covered earlier this episode. The question over whether Eric Mario put Veronal in Thalmas milk. The expert medical testimony called for the prosecution did not satisfy me. The alternative explanations of Mario's suspicious behaviour. He was nervous about something and was hiding something, but I'm not satisfied that his nervousness was not about the abortion drug bought from the chemist. In the end, Justice Callan just wasn't buying what the prosecution was selling. I could not finally convince myself of Mario's guilt, except by consideration of the other evidence. But consideration of these other matters, even collectively, has not had the effect of carrying my mind beyond grave suspicion. The person on the other end of this unprecedented letter was the Attorney-General, Rex Mason, who would end up becoming the longest-serving MP in New Zealand history, the only one to crack 40 years. He was also a member of the first-ever Labour government. And for Labour, the Mario case was a tricky issue. For a long time, Labour had been campaigning to abolish capital punishment, but this was the first time they actually had an opportunity to commute a death sentence. Some Labour MPs seemed to have wondered if it was better to let Eric Mario swing and wait for another, more sympathetic offender to fight for. The Truth reported this after talking to one wavering Labour MP. There was no sympathy, it was said, for a man who, when granted a second trial, used it to call evidence to blacken the name of a woman, his wife, whose tongue was stilled. From the point of view of an opponent of capital punishment, he continued, it was unfortunate that such a case was the first that would have to be decided by the new Labour government. But the Attorney-General, Rex Mason, wasn't going to let Eric Mario hang. 
Together with his allies, he convinced his fellow government ministers to commute Eric's sentence to life in prison. Why? Well, I'm speculating here, but Rex Mason was a pretty unconventional character by the standards of mainstream New Zealand. He was a theosophist, a follower of Indian spiritualism, also a strict vegetarian and a teetotaler. Maybe he felt some sympathy for Eric Mario as a fellow cultural misfit. Whatever the reason, Rex Mason became obsessed with the Mario case. Over the next four decades, he wrote hundreds of pages of notes about it. When he died in 1975, he'd started turning those notes into a full book about the case. Even when he moved on from the Attorney General post to other portfolios, he kept working with a wide group of supporters to petition for Eric Mario's release. Maybe their greatest moment came in 1944, when the senior official analyst to the British Home Office reviewed the case and basically said the medical evidence the prosecution relied on was flat out wrong. I am quite convinced that there was no varanol in the milk and that there is no scientific reason whatever to suppose the contrary. There were multiple petitions lobbying for Eric Mario's release from prison. At first, they failed probably partly because it was the middle of World War II and the government had bigger things to worry about than Eric Mario. It also didn't help that the New Zealand Truth was doing all it could to keep Mario locked up. One of the Truth headlines is, Glamour boy of toughest jail, convicts jealous of Eric Mario's amazing privileges. (laughs) You know, it's that kind of stuff. What the Truth didn't mention was that Eric Mario had suffered two tragedies while he was locked up. Both Betty and Graham um, fled to, back to England uh, immediately after the second trial. Um, Betty died almost straight away. She got, I think, appendicitis and just died suddenly. The prison chaplain described the moment he broke the news about Betty's death to her father. The wretchedness of the 15 minutes in which I spoke to the broken-hearted Mario will never be forgotten. The last words I heard as he left the private room in which he had had the interview were, poor darling Betty, poor Graham, God give me strength. Just a few months later, Graham also died. He was killed fighting in France shortly after D-Day. These tragedies didn't affect the attitude of the New Zealand truth, as efforts to get Eric Mario released from prison gathered steam in 1947, it doubled down. It would be a travesty of justice if all the rejections of the most strenuous efforts made to disprove Mario's guilt were to be thwarted by the failure of a minister to face the facts and realise the seriousness of turning loose on the community a man convicted of the most satanic crime in the criminal calendar. They seem to have been, not just in New Zealand, but in Britain and presumably the rest of the world, kind of obsessed with poisoning at this time. Um, The number of novels by people like Agatha Christie and Dorothy Sayers and people like that, in which the the murder's done with poison, is just sort of remarkable. Poison was viewed as a particularly sinister and awful way to talk to someone. Cowardly way. Cowardly, um, yeah. Mm. I think that added to the stigma attaching to Mario in a sense that it, that it was the sort of cowardly thing to do. Despite all the truth's efforts, Eric Mario was granted parole in May 1948. But Eric never felt free of suspicion. He was in constant fear that some small slip-up would get him locked up again. I think he got done for speeding. I remember John Henry, who was a judge, saying that he remembered Mario coming into the law offices saying, you've got to help me, I've, got, you know, I've had a speeding ticket, I don't want to go back to jail. Eric repeatedly wrote to the authorities, asking for his parole conditions to be eased, especially the requirement to report to his parole officer every fortnight. The necessity of reporting is so very much on my mind that even when I'm at work composing, orchestrating or practising the piano, I simply cannot forget it. 
I know you will understand when I say that in some indescribable way it is as if I were mentally still in prison. Eric Mario applied every year to be discharged from parole. His request was finally granted in December 1958. In some of his requests, Eric had included letters from his doctor saying the strain of his parole conditions was severely damaging his health. And maybe that was true. Just two years after he was discharged from parole, Eric Mario suffered a heart attack and died. He was 66 years old. As for Frida Stark, she went on to become incredibly famous in New Zealand show business. The cafe in Auckland Civic Theatre is still named after her. She also became an icon of the gay rights movement. She was one of the first publicly lesbian figures in New Zealand society. And she never forgot Thelma Mario. After the trial, she had these words engraved on Thelma's headstone. Waiting till we meet again. Frida Stark. When Frida herself died in 1999, she was buried next to Thelma. Given Frida is such a beloved figure, it's hard to face some of the nagging questions around her evidence in Eric Mario's trial. It's something Justice Ellis and Dr Ferrell still struggle with. I certainly wouldn't um, suggest that she was um, malevolent. I mean, it might be. I, it may be that she wanted to see Mario go to jail. Though I, I do, I, I might believe that. Believe that. Sorry to interrupt, but not, yeah. but not to go to jail. He was going to be hanged. Mm. Yes. You know, she, she nearly sent this guy to his death. And yes, she was grief struck. Yes, she loved Thelma, etc., etc., etc. But you know, I bet you it weighed on her. Con- if she had a con, if it didn't, it's even worse. But it must have weighed on her conscience all those years. It's one of those unfortunate facts of history. There are very few uncomplicated heroes and villains. Eric Mario and Frida Stark both had their flaws, and so did New Zealand society, or should I say so does New Zealand society. Our morbid fascination with murder trials hasn't gone anywhere. Look at our obsession with Scott Guy or David Bain. We're not so different from all those people who are hooked to the New Zealand Truth sensationalist coverage of the Mario case. Thanks for listening. Now, one thing I didn't have a chance to include in this podcast was some of Eric Mario's music. Tim Dodd from RNZ Concert dug out some of his old compositions and very kindly recorded some of them for me, and I couldn't find a place to use them in the actual podcast, unfortunately, so we're going to use them as our outro music. Very special thanks to my guests, Dr Charles Ferrell and Justice Rebecca Ellis. Believe it or not, this case has even more twists and turns than we had space for in this podcast, so if you want the full story, check out their book, The Trials of Eric Mario. This is the last episode of Black Sheep for this season, but we will be back next year. In the meantime, I'm going to be working on a new series of the Aotearoa History Show, and if you have any particular topics you'd like us to cover in that show, please email me. You can reach me at william.ray at rnz.co.nz. Black Sheep is written and presented by me, William Ray. Our sound engineer is William Saunders, and the executive producer is Tim Watkin. Thanks to Liz Garten for some extra editorial support. This episode broke an all-time record for the number of voice actors in a Black Sheep podcast, so let's see if I can get through them all in one take. Charlotte Cook, Duncan Smith, Simon Dickinson, Robert Kelly, Phil Pennington, Alison Balance, Dominic Godfrey, Max Toll, Grant Walker, Katie Gossett, Jim Mora, Emile Donovan, and William Saunders. Nailed it. 
Um, by the way, if you're interested in the impact the Mario case had on New Zealand drug laws, check out From Zero. It's a podcast RNZ produced a few years back looking at the history of drugs in New Zealand, and the Mario case actually gets a mention in one of their episodes. Also, check out the Untold Pacific History podcast and documentary series. Their first episode released last week, all about the Dawn Raids. I guarantee if you enjoy Black Sheep, you will love Untold Pacific History. You can find From Zero and Untold Pacific History together with Black Sheep at rnz.co.nz. You can also follow and download our episodes at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or whichever other podcasting app you prefer. That's all from me, Kaki Te Ano.